Thank you very much, Ksenia. And um, this should actually be working. I don't know if you hear me well. Uh, thank you all for being here today. And um, I'm very happy to have the chance to introduce our uh, microfinance parameter that we do at uh, Convergences. So my name is Karine and I will try today to drive you through uh, the latest microfinance figures and trends uh, in the world but also at the European level. So uh, I'll try to keep uh, some time at the end for questions. So do not hesitate if you have any or to reach out to me in the end. Uh, so uh, first of all I'd like maybe to take one second to introduce you a bit the work we do at Convergences because the real, the very reason why we even exist is because of microfinance and financial issues. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story, a story about our founder. Uh, his name is Frédéric Roussel and he founded the biggest, the second biggest French NGO. It's called ACTED and it's active in more than 30 countries all over the world in conflict areas and so on. And a few years ago, about 15 years ago, he decided to create a microfinance institution. And he realized while trying to do so that it was really complicated for him at the time, coming from the humanitarian sector, to build uh, this kind of, uh, of organization, a microfinance organization. It was difficult for him to talk to banks, it was difficult for him to talk to other NGOs who wouldn't understand why he was talking so much about money, and it was difficult for him just to find its way through the whole financial ecosystem. And this is when he realized there was a real need for a platform for, talk, for talking, for sharing, for peer uh, exchange on topics such as finance and development. And this is how Convergences was born uh, 10 years ago. And today we are a platform for reflection and action around the sustainable development goals. And we try and build partnerships between all the sectors of the development sector. We do so by trying to inspire, but also bring people together so that we can help them and support them in replicating partnerships and initiatives that already work. And uh, one of the things we do is uh, that we have a big forum in Paris every year that gathers more than 4,000 attendees and 300 speakers every year to discuss those development and finance issues. Uh, this year we were lucky enough to get uh, to, to welcome Professor Mohamed Yunus uh, this year in Paris and it was a really nice experience for, for all of us. And um, as you can see, finance is still one of our main areas of, uh, of activity and in particular we have a microfinance barometer that we do and that, uh, that, is, that has become a, a leading publication over the years. Uh, since 2010, we have, had more than, we have had nine editions, and it's a top-rated publication that's featured on the World Bank CGAP uh, gateway, for instance, and that is widely recognized for showcasing data from, uh, from recognized players, such as the mixed market or FinDev, uh, figures. So what we provide is up-to-date and exclusive data that I will drive you through and also uh, we try and highlight debates uh, that are going through the, the microfinance sector such as the role of microfinance in the achievement of the SDGs, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but also uh, we try and, uh, and answer questions such as uh, does microfinance still work today? That was the, the previous issue. And this year we focused a lot on profitability. So I'm going to, to talk a lot about profitability today. Uh, but uh, we can of course uh, exchange on, on more topics uh, later on. So first thing we will go through together is the global figures for microfinance. So uh, what's need to be uh, understood is that these are uh, mixed market figures, so it's not the figures for the whole world and each and every MFI in the world, but it's, uh, it's data that's widely recognized and that gathers more than a thousand MFIs to, to, build, uh, to build this data. So um, this is uh, in a map that we do every year of microfinance. Uh, you can photograph it if you want. You can also find it on our website with our microfinance parameter that's available for download. And I have a few copies that you can grab in the end if you want to. Uh, so this map is really about uh, figures for each region in the world. And we try to highlight 
what's different, what's the same. Uh, what you can see on the map is that some of the circles are bigger. Uh, they represent the, um, the portfolio size by region. Uh, but you can also see small characters. They represent client base uh, in every region. So you can see, for instance, Asia is bigger because client base is bigger, but I, I'll go through specific, uh, specific figures. Um, so according to Findex data, not mixed market this time, there are 69 percent people of every adult in the world that has access to a bank account. So that means that 31 percent of the people in the world, they don't have access to banking. So there's a lot of room for microfinance to grow, but it's still a growing number. More and more people get access to banking, to bank accounts. Uh, between 2014 and 2017, it grew by seven points. So it's a, a big uh, achievement uh, all around the world. Uh, microfinance has a huge part to play uh, in this improvement. And uh, as of 2017, those are estimates, there are 100 and 39 million people in the world benefiting from, uh, from services from microfinance institutions. Um, the portfolio uh, stands at $114 billion in the world in 2017. So this is a, a, num a figure that is actually growing uh, from one year to the other. Uh, and it's starting to grow even faster over the previous year. Uh, as you can maybe see, but I, I'll tell because it's uh, written very small. In 2016, the sev uh, in 2015, the portfolio had grown by uh, 8%. Uh, in 2016 by 9% and 2017 by 15%. So uh, the growth is getting bigger and bigger uh, over the past few years and so is the client base. Uh, today uh, there are 139 million clients worldwide uh, and this grew by 5%. Uh, in 2017. So this growth is actually slowing, so is, is actually becoming slower uh, compared to previous years. So this is actually really interesting. This means that the portfolio is growing faster uh, than the client base, probably meaning that uh, the average loan amount is growing as well. Uh, so, you, so that you need less customer to achieve a higher uh, portfolio outstanding. So these are, these are global figures. Um, another interesting fact to, to mention is that 83% of clients of, uh, of MFIs are women in the world. So that means that uh, women are still a very uh, targeted segment for MFIs and that uh, they saw their social inclusion mission uh, as being also a women inclusion uh, mission. So maybe going through uh, with a, a bit more details, uh, I'll go back to, to the map later on. Um, almost half of the global portfolio is in Latin, Latin America and the Caribbean, 44%. Um, as you can see, the second biggest market is South Asia regarding amount of loans and portfolio. Uh, but what is interesting to notice is that we don't find the same repartition when it comes to borrowers. 60% of them are in South Asia. So this means that l loans are very much smaller uh, in South Asia, where you have a lot of customer but not such a big portfolio, compared to Latin America that stands for, for 40, more than 40% of the global portfolio, but only 17% of the global borrowers. So this is an interesting fact, I think, to, to highlight. And then, for instance, if you take East Asia, that's uh, the yellow brownish one, uh, you can see that the, the percentage it represents at global level regarding portfolio and regarding, um, and regarding borrowers is much more closer, meaning that it's closer than to average uh, on both on both sides. So um, these are these are figures that I, I thought were interesting to share. Other uh, things I mentioned uh, or just written just there. Um, so the growth is there as well for borrowers and portfolio. And what is also interesting to notice is that among the biggest countries by number of borrowers. Um, countries from South Asia, from East Asia, and from Latin America 
or uh, or in the top ten, uh, which uh, which makes perfect sense regarding those are the the biggest markets. Uh, it's dominated by India because there's a huge potential and a huge uh, client base there. Um, other big countries include Bangladesh, Brazil, uh, Mexico. There are disparities between countries. As you can see um, on the third column, you would have the number of borrowers and on the other side, the size of the portfolio. And as you can see, and as we already mentioned, it takes much less borrowers, for instance, in Colombia to reach a big portfolio than it takes in, for instance, uh, let's say, Mexico, where you need much more customers because loans uh, are actually smaller. Interesting figures uh, are also the ones regarding uh, profitability. So this year, in our microfinance barometer, we tried to, uh, yeah, to talk about this issue, which is sometimes uh, not an easy issue to talk about in the, in the microfinance world. Uh, it is essential for microfinance to have some profitability and returns on the, on the, on the loans, uh, but it's a, com a concept that is not always easy to grasp, and it's also not always easy to talk about it. Should MFIs even be profitable? This is a question some of our members and committee uh, experts have actually asked when we brought up this topic. Uh, if so, if it's profitable, can it also s be socially responsible? That's also an interesting question to, to highlight. Well, it's not always easy to say this is profitable, this is not. It depends a lot on MFIs, on their business models, also on the regions. But a few figures that are interesting regarding profitability are the, are the following. Um, one that's really interesting is that the PAR, portfolio at risk uh, exceeding 30 days, has increased by more than 50% uh, over, the past few over the past year. So this means not that MFIs are less profitable, but it, that the context has gotten more risky for them and that more and more customers are at risk of not uh, repaying. Uh, the global portfolio yield is uh, still good. It's uh, up to 20% uh, in 2017, but it's decreasing from, from the previous year. Uh, return on equity on the other end uh, went up uh, to 12.6% in 2017 on average, uh, but and the operating expense ratio is also decreasing, so those are rather good signs, uh, so to say. Uh, and one last figure that's not up there, but it's also interesting, is that global ROA, uh, return on assets, uh, stands at 3.1% uh, for, uh, for 2017, no, 23 sorry. Uh, the highest uh, is at 3.5 in, uh, in South Asia. So those are all figures that are interesting regarding, uh, regarding the profitability. Uh, but what we also try to look at uh, when doing our barometer is not only profitability, but also performance at a global, at a more global level. And performance uh, actually can be social, and social performance is very, uh, very important. Of course, profitability is important, uh, but social performance is equally important, and there's a very uh, interdependent relationship between the two. Uh, one of our, of our contributors uh, actually wrote this year, and I thought it's interesting, uh, that microfinance should be profitable in order to last. Uh, but it's so it should also be socially responsible uh, to make a difference in, the, in people's lives, in beneficiaries' lives, and be environmentally aware uh, in order to contribute to fighting climate change, for instance. So I think it's a good uh, combination of all of those uh, uh, yeah, goals that microfinance sets uh, for itself. Um, so the real question is, what is a good profitability rate? Uh, we based ourselves on the SPI4 standards that most of you probably already know. Uh, it's an audit tool also, and they consider that ROA about above 3% is high and about above 7.5% is very high and maybe questionable. And uh, actually there are lots of reasons that can explain high ROA and a strong need for 
profitability, for instance, um, high, uh, high expenses, inflation, uh, MFI is providing non-financial services and therefore needing more money to be able to provide those services. So there are lots of, uh, of, re of reasons uh, why ROA could be high and could be needed to be, to be so high. Um, however, this needs to be legitimate so that MFIs can continue on um, improving the services they, they provide to the, to the poorest and most marginalized uh, people in the world. Um, standards that are useful regarding social performance are the universal standards for social performance management. And they look at many dimensions. Uh, for instance, uh, ensuring that everyone is on the same page at board level, at employees level, at customer level. Uh, for instance, designing products that meet the client needs, really, and uh, also treating clients, employees responsibly, all of those uh, or, or inside those universal standards. Um, and it can actually lead to increased profitability. Uh, if you know, uh, for instance, what is the market capacity, if you monitor that, if you set precise goals, then you can uh, make products that meet market needs better. If you know your client base, if you are very, uh, if you are treating them well, if you try and get feedback from them, then you can build products that are more related to what they need and that they will be more likely to purchase, for instance. And if you reduce staff turnover, for instance, if you treat employees responsibly, then it's better also for employees' costs. So social performance and profitability, they are really related and that's one of the, the findings we had in, the, in this latest issue. So what might be interesting now is um, maybe to focus uh, very quickly and briefly on, on regions. Uh, as you saw, on the, uh, I have like small parts of the map uh, that you can uh, that you can look at more more precisely. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean is the biggest portfolio on the planet so far. Uh, they were really pioneers in uh, in microfinance, uh, and uh, what can be noticed uh, is that they are the biggest, but not in client base. And um, well, growth in in borrowers is actually slowing getting slower and uh, it's very dependent on countries but you see it was growing faster in previous years and this year it's growing only by one percent so almost not growing and it depends a lot of, of on countries for instance in in peru it's going up by nine percent but in countries such as mexico it's going down by three percent and it all equalizes at one percent uh, portfolio on the other end is growing uh, another thing to, to notice is that performance is really stable in the region, so that's a good thing, but at the same time it's not growing very much. And uh, a specificity that there is in, uh, in this region is also that most, most borrowers come from urban areas and not rural ones, uh, which is uh, very different from other regions where the target is mostly on women and also on uh, farmers and uh, rural areas uh, inhabitants. So uh, that, that's a big specificity of the region. Uh, the, the only thing that stands out is the Caribbean, where more than 50% of, uh, of borrowers are actually uh, from uh, farming areas. In Africa, the portfolio is different and it's also smaller. Uh, an important thing to, to notice is that uh, Africa has the highest yield of all region uh, in 2016, uh, standing at 26% compared to 20 uh, globally. So this is a, a rather good indicator. And this is in spite of a very poor uh, portfolio quality, uh, since uh, portfolio at risk stands out 14%. So uh, these are these are interesting figures about um, about Africa. And then again, it depends a lot on regions. In West Africa, it's pretty stable, not growing very much. Uh, in countries such as Kenya, context plays. Uh, a, a, a big, big part. Uh, for instance, there were prolongated elections uh, and that led in, uh, in higher risk uh, for, for MFIs and the contraction of the customer base, for instance, in this, uh, in this country. So what, what needs to be reminded about it is that in Africa, uh, there's a rather good performance for, for the previous year with a 3% ROA last year. So pretty, uh, pretty interesting as well. Um, 
quickly going to Middle East. Middle East is the s one of the smallest region we, we look at. Uh, they, they have uh, microfinance institutions, of course, uh, but they are not uh, a very big region, uh, either portfolio or client-based uh, wise. Um, what's interesting to notice is that um, there's a, yeah, a good growth rate on both the portfolio and the the borrow the borrow base. Um, they are having a quite good portfolio quality with a very low uh, portfolio at risk. For for instance, um, but it's yeah, this return on asset is still pretty small at one one point six percent. So compared to other regions, it's not that high. Um, it's a, yeah, as I mentioned, a very small region, so nothing to do compared to South Asia, which uh, you can see is very much, uh, very much bigger. Uh, portfolios stand at 27 uh, billion in 2017, uh, and customer base at 83 uh, mil million people. So this is really big considering that uh, the world uh, client base is 139 million. So it's, uh, it's a really, really big part of them. Uh, it's the biggest market, actually, in terms of, uh, of borrowers. Uh, and it contributes to lead uh, global outreach and global uh, growth. However, the growth in borrowers, it's still good. It's 6% this year. But it's getting smaller compared to, to previous years. Um, and this is uh, mostly due to the situation in India in 2016, where there was a demonetization decree uh, that led to difficulties for MFIs and for customers to, to repay their, their loans. Mm. Another thing that is very interesting in this region is that it's really focused on women. 92% uh, of the customers in South Asia are women, so this is huge. The focus on men is very, very small compared to other regions. And they are clearly leading also the, um, yeah, that number of women, that 83% of women between of borrowers uh, the at global level. Well, this is mostly due to, to South Asia. And they also focus a lot on rural areas, so women and rural areas. And regarding performance, there's something really interesting. What's interesting uh, about it is that uh, cost per borrower is very small. Uh, it stands at, uh, according to mixed figure, to $25 uh, per borrower, which is very, very much slower, uh, smaller uh, than, than for other regions. For instance, uh, in the most costly region, which is Latin America and the Caribbean, it's $235. So it's 10 times uh, smaller. So this is mostly due to the, the methodology that's, uh, that's being applied in South Asia. And these are group-based methodology allowing um, MFIs to take care of several clients once at the same time. So uh, this is a, an interesting model uh, regarding uh, cost management, notably. And uh, last region I wanted to, to, to go through uh, briefly is uh, East Asia and the Pacific. As you can see, uh, some of the characteristics are very similar to South Asia. Uh, for instance, there's a very strong focus on women and on uh, rural areas. Uh, the, w the focus on women is even bigger. It's 94% of the, of, the, of the borrowers, so it's really huge. Uh, performance uh, is good there as well as uh, growth uh, in terms of borrowers, uh, plus 10% uh, this year, and in terms of portfolio that uh, grew by 18% uh, over the past year. So it's, uh, it's really getting bigger. Actually, some countries have even uh, witnessed a, a very big uh, increase in the, in the number of borrowers. Uh, for instance, in the Philippines, uh, in Myanmar, or in Indonesia, the customer base uh, rose by more than 15%, which is uh, actually pretty huge uh, for over, over a year. Um, but the, the yield is a bit lower than, than average. So this is a, an overview of region by region, what's, uh, what's going on. Uh, and there's one region I wanted maybe to, uh, to spend more time uh, talking about, and it's um, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Uh, since we are uh, here today in Estonia, and I know many of you are working in, in those regions, uh, I thought it could be interesting to, uh, to maybe uh, look at that a bit more, uh, a bit more in detail. Um, so, 
compared to other regions such as Africa or South Asia, of course the region is not the biggest, either in terms of portfolio or in terms of, uh, of customers, but still, uh, it's interesting to, to notice that uh, portfolio size uh, grew again this year by 6% according to mixed market figures, uh, which is good compared to previous year where there was a contraction in the in the portfolio and also a contraction in the bar in the borrower base. But actually, this uh, this contraction of the client number is continuing, uh, and the, the number diminished by two percent this year again. So uh, there are mixed uh, there are mixed figures, uh, and the, the focus on rural areas is actually quite similar to the to the average, uh, which is interesting considering this is a more urban areas than other uh, regions of the world. Um, regarding the state of the market, so the portfolio stands at 7.2 billion this year, uh, representing 6% of global portfolio. So as, as I mentioned, it's not the biggest, uh, the biggest market, but still uh, there's, a, there's a lot to, to be done there. Average loan balance is uh, much higher uh, than the than t than other regions, uh, and it stands at two hundred and two thousand and no two thousand and two hundred uh, dollars in two thousand seventeen. So this is actually the highest uh, average loan amount of all regions. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, the context is still challenging, and there has been for the third year in a row this contraction in borrower base and. Um, this is also due to the situation of some countries in mostly Central Asia. Uh, for instance, uh, in uh, Azerbaijan and Tajikistan, where there were uh, new norms uh, regarding MFIs and the work of, uh, of microfinance practitioners. Uh, so some licenses were revoked uh, and it led to a, a decrease in outreach. Uh, for instance, in Azerbaijan, the, bar the borrower base uh, shrank by a quarter, which is actually a lot. Um, so, uh, going quickly through the, through the funding structure of uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia MFIs, um, what we can notice is that they rely less on equity than average and more on borrowing. It's quite similar uh, regarding deposits. Um, and uh, if we have a, a quick look on clients uh, of MFIs, What's uh, interesting to notice is that uh, MFIs hold 2.8 million clients uh, in that region, um, representing 2% of global borrowers. So what you can notice is that uh, I the portfolio is representing 6% of the global portfolio, but uh, borrowers only 2% of global clients. Um, and a very interesting fact uh, about the region is that uh, there are more male clients than female, and that's actually the only region where this is the case. Um, and there's a yeah, the, the focus on women is much less uh, stronger than in other regions. At global level, 83% of clients are women, so there's a there's a huge difference. Uh, and the gender gap has it has actually increased uh, over the past few years for microfinance uh, clients. Um, despite a, a global improvement for access to financial services by women all around uh, the globe and for men as well. So, um, as I mentioned, there are lots of borrowers coming from rural areas and uh, there's a cost per borrower that stands at uh, almost $200, so it's quite a lot, but not as much as in Latin America, for instance. Uh, as you can see, the cost per borrower is higher than, than average, but it's still lower than, than Latin America. And regarding uh, profitability, well, there, there's been a huge increase of delays in repayment. Uh, portfolio at risk has, uh, has grown as well. So, um, well, this is uh, not such a, a good figure, but there are also uh, good signs, uh, of course. And Azerbaijan and Tajikistan also uh, this time have been a, a part of the, the reason why the figures are not that good uh, since they faced an impact uh, of, the, of the norms I, I just mentioned on the, on the performance. For instance, uh, they had negative assets, a return on assets in Azerbaijan uh, that was minus 8% uh, over the past year. So this is actually a lot and of course there's been a contraction uh, in the portfolio and in the borrower base for a few years now so it's not easy uh, for all countries to to recover uh, but there's still there are uh, interesting signs as you can see it's the only uh, region with negative return on assets and negative return on equity for 2016 
Yield is uh, close to average, however, so this is uh, rather good news. Uh, operating expense ratio, it's also close than to average uh, compared to other regions. And um, yeah, that's it for for the region, uh, but I thought it would be interesting to, to bring that up. Uh, another and, uh, and last topic I wanted to mention uh, is also the, the difference uh, between several, um, between the Western and Eastern Europe, and maybe also mentioned uh, what's not different, but uh, what gathers them uh, regarding, uh, regarding microfinance. So, as you all know, microfinance was first intended intended to emerging countries, developing countries, and this is much less the case in Europe, either Western or Eastern. Uh, in Western Europe, the sector is younger than in, in Western Europe, younger than in Eastern Europe. Uh, in Eastern Europe, it started developing after the, the fall of the communist regimes uh, in a context where uh, financial institutions were not as strong as they are now, so there was a, a real need for, for those uh, for those microfinance in institutions. Uh, in Europe, there are very different types of, uh, of MFIs. Uh, lots of them are actually NGOs and non-bank uh, non financial services. They can also be credit unions or cooperatives, so they, there is a wide uh, range of, uh, of models. Uh, what drives uh, those MFIs are, and the, the main product is professional uh, microloans, helping people to, to create their own business, uh, their own activity and their own uh, source of, uh, of revenues. Uh, it's estimated uh, that uh, microfinance in Europe um, has a strong potential demand, standing at 17 billion euros. So it's huge, especially compared to the size it has today, uh, that, it, that stands between 2 and 3 billion euros. So there's a wide uh, room for, for more services and for microcredit uh, in Europe, and there's a lot that, uh, that could be done. Uh, it is estimated by the uh, EMC MFC survey, which is the European Microfinance Network and Microfinance Centre, survey uh, that there are more than 7,000 microloans that were disbursed uh, in Europe in 2017 uh, for a portfolio of 2 billion. So this is getting bigger. And actually, it's estimated that the sector grew by more than 50% between 2012 and 2016. So uh, yeah, the microfinance sector in Europe grew a lot uh, over the past few years, but there's room for even more growth, uh, considering there's a high demand, uh, especially in a context where the economic growth is not that high at uh, country level in Europe, and where it's not easy for the most uh, you know, impoverished population, uh, disadvantaged one. Uh, economic growth is not enough to lift everyone out of poverty or to lift everyone to, uh, to better standards of living. And microfinance can really be a, a way of, uh, of addressing that. And um, there's also a trend and a tendency for more and more self-employment, uh, micro-enterprises, company creation, and microfinance can also be uh, a very good way to answer that and to, um, and to, and to answer this demand. Um, one thing that is also very specific uh, to Europe uh, is that there's a huge uh, room for fi non-financial services and support uh, for, for borrowers. It's something very specific that's not as present uh, in, in other regions, but in Europe it's a very, very strong focus, especially for Western MFIs. And maybe going to, to other figures regarding Western Eastern uh, MFIs, as I mentioned, microfinance is more mature in Eastern Europe than it is in, uh, in Western Europe. Um, the average return on equity is quite good in Europe. It grew from 2.8 to 5.7% uh, in Europe. Uh, so yeah, 7.7, 5.7 uh, was in 2015, so I don't have uh, up to date figure into that, but it's, uh, it's interesting to notice that uh, this was mainly driven uh, by Eastern Europe uh, MFIs actually. And um, return on equity in Western Europe is actually negative. So it's really driven by Eastern Europe MFIs. Uh, for instance, uh, out of the 98 MFIs that were surveyed by the EMN MFC survey, most of them, 80% uh, of those who had uh, positive returns, 
were East European and there was the one achieving uh, self-operational uh, sufficiency. So there's a real trend for those MFIs to really lead uh, profitability in Europe. Um, in Western Europe, things are a bit different. Uh, microfinance tends to be even more social, uh, kind of, and uh, so the social performance is quite good, but uh, it's not uh, allowing uh, sufficient profitability rates. Uh, an interesting figure from the from the barometer that I remember that I would like to, to share with you is that, for instance, in France, uh, where microcredit is developing, it is uh, estimated that for MFIs to have a to reach uh, break-even and to be balanced on the financial uh, level, they would need to apply a 30% interest rate, which is huge and which would not be acceptable for clients. So they have to lower that and to find other sources of funding. So sometimes they are state funded, sometimes they are uh, companies funded, and they have to find other ways and other business model to, to keep on, on doing uh, microfinance and having social return. So models are very different between East and West. And and uh, yeah, in Europe, Western Europe, they are struggling with uh, sustainability because of uncertain profitability due to a high operating cost, of course, uh, with a lot of non-financial non social services. And uh, there's a downward trend in interest rate that also dampens uh, their ability to make, uh, to make profits. So um, this is all regarding Eastern versus Western Europe uh, trends and figures. Uh, but uh, Nonetheless, uh, this is uh, yeah, a real sign that uh, there's room for more microfinance in Western Europe, but also in Eastern Europe. The figures you've just seen, they are concerning the whole of Europe, not Central Asia, so they're a bit different from what you, you saw previously. So yeah, to conclude, uh, maybe few facts and figures that we just uh, discussed. Well, uh, biggest market regarding borrowers is South Asia, with more than 60% of global borrowers. Um, Latin America and the Caribbean uh, remains the biggest market in terms of uh, portfolio, with more than 44% uh, of the global uh, portfolio value. Um, Africa is the one with the highest yield. So good performance in Africa and uh, ROA is at 3.1%, so it's, uh, it's pretty good. Uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia uh, registered a good yield this year, but uh, negative return on assets and negative return on equity. Uh, so there are struggles uh, in that region. However, um, as, we, as, we, as we saw, there's big, big room for more microfinance uh, in Europe, uh, Eastern and Western. So lots, lots to be done, actually. And um, yeah, what I can offer you now is to uh, maybe download the barometer for more data and more precise uh, figures on all of those uh, things I mentioned previ previously. And uh, you can download it from the Convergences uh, website. Uh, I also have a, a few copies that I would be happy to share with some of you if you, if you want to. Uh, they're in English, so uh, easily readable for everyone. And uh, we will also be at Convergences organization organizing webinar with the FinDev Gateway, which was the former SIGAP Gateway. And um, so we'll organize those webinars. Next one is in French, so if some of you speak French, it might be interesting for you. Uh, and it's regarding microfinance in Europe, so maybe we'll have a translation. It's not decided yet, but uh, keep a look at that because we'll keep on uh, having specific sessions on specific issues from the barometer and other things we do. So. Yeah, thank you for your attention. I don't know if we have time for questions, but you can meet me in the end. Yeah. Thank you, Karim. Really fantastic report. I think everyone would agree that you gave us a really good global vision of, of what's happening in microfinance in the world and in Europe. And the gender issue, of course, was a, for me, it was a great surprise that it's so big difference between genders in, uh, in different regions. Mm. Um, I, I actually wanted you to, uh, to ask you if uh, you have uh, these kind of reports country by country. Um, I don't have those uh, country by country, or at least not a report that we would uh, highlight this much. Uh, but we do have data uh, that's more specific on each region. And uh, we work with mixed market, and they provide data on uh, every country and every situation. And we could definitely maybe ask them more. I don't have the, the precise detail, but it would definitely be interesting to dig so more into that. So if anyone wants to go deeper, they at least can contact you? Yes, of course, of course. And then um, we can get more data to, to share with you. them. Any, any questions? 
Guys, wake up, okay. <laughs> uh, do we have any other microphone? Oh, my microphone is the only one. Yeah, maybe if there are several que questions, we can take several at a time and then I'll answer them. Hi. Hi. Uh, so my question is about like this gender inequality. Mm -hmm. So basically, could you please uh, name some reasons why uh, this shift to femi feminine uh, customers is existing in Asia especially? Is it like culture-wise or is it like purely uh, financial reasons? I think I wouldn't call it either cultural or financial. Uh, many MFIs, from what I know, and there might be other re reasons that I'm not aware of, of course, uh, is that MFIs working there have a strong focus on financial inclusion. And when uh, setting up microfinance programs, uh, they, they looked also at including uh, the most marginalized populations. And the one who had the most struggles uh, in accessing an account and having access to banking services were women. And uh, sometimes there are kind of militants, you know, those MFIs, and they want to provide uh, those who are the most uh, deprived from those services with uh, services. They also, uh, for some MFIs, have a strong focus on empowering women, and so providing microfinance is also a way of doing so. So they, I, I'd say there's a strong MFI focus on those, uh, on those, uh, on those types of, of, on those segments uh, of customers, especially women and especially in South Asia. And then it depends a lot on regions, as, we, as I mentioned. Um, I think it also depends sometimes on cultural context in some regions in Africa, not everywhere. Uh, they would rely more on women because they think they are more more able to repay and more willing to do so. Uh, I think South Asia is, is a bit different. It's also really about uh, empowering women and having a strong target into those. But I, I, I guess that'd be also an interest in developing it uh, for everyone and not just women in that region since there are lots of, uh, of gaps uh, still in uh, answering the needs. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. And uh, I have um, two questions. Mm -hmm. First, uh, where is North America? Because it, it wasn't have all, the, all the world except uh, United mm -hmm. States and Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second question, do you know the number of the microfinance companies which are working in more than one country? So if you take South Asia, how many mm -hmm. only companies who are working in yep. India and how many companies who are working in more, more than one country? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, we are actually yeah, focusing on this barometer on many regions, uh, but as you can see, indeed, uh, there, there's no data on North America and there's no data uh, from the mixed market that we can have uh, regarding Western Europe. And that's really a gap that we would like to, to close for the, for the next year. So unfortunately, I don't have uh, precise figures for North America, so I won't make them up, of course. Uh, but uh, I guess we could uh, get some more maybe from the mix or others and then share it with those who are interested here. Uh, and regarding the number of MFIs worldwide, I wouldn't know the precise number worldwide, but uh, at least I know those that reported and those that uh, we use the data. And there are about a thousand uh, in the world, but of course they have you know, affiliates and branches and so on, but uh, there's a thousand ones uh, reporting. And then, uh, yeah, I can uh, definitely go back to, um, to region by region uh, division uh, regarding regarding those, so uh, what we have is that uh, the, the highest number of MFIs reporting is actually in uh, in, uh, in South Asia with more than 280. Uh, it's more than 200 in Latin America. Uh, the number is smaller in the Middle East, just 30. Uh, or, or reporting and operating, so it's smaller. Uh, in Eastern Europe, it's about 180, uh, and yeah, 160 in both Africa and East Asia from, from the data I have, which is not, of course, exhaustive, so there might be more, but it's at least that number, so that's a minimal. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, thank you, Corinne, for this thank you uh, very fantastic much. report. As I said, I know that very many um, uh, Eastern European MFIs are targeting new markets, looking at them, especially like uh, some, some are going to Africa, mm -hmm. some to South Asia and, uh, and Latin America. So I think this report is really interesting in terms of global vision. Thank you so much. Thanks, Senya, and do not hesitate to reach out to me for any more questions.